Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Chandler. I'm director of the Frankie Institute for the Humanities at the University of Chicago, which together with the Division of the Humanities sponsors these now quarterly presentations here at the Gleacher Center, beautiful facility. Uh, welcome back to many of you, and um, glad to have you with us if those are, for those of you who are coming here for the first time. Um, this is the last of this year's presentations. We'll be back next year, uh, and we'll have the schedule up on the Frankie Institute website before too long, still in progress. Um, but we're very glad to uh, finish this year with a talk that is also associated with a recently published book. We like to do that for many reasons. And uh, I think it's going to be a, a terrific talk. Um, before I introduce the introducer, I wanted to tell you something about the context of this uh, presentation today. Uh, we have at the Frankie Institute this year, uh, running for the whole year, uh, something called a Sawyer Seminar, a year-long seminar sponsored by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, this year's seminar is called Around 1948, Multidisciplinary Approaches to a Global Transformation. Um, uh, we've had quite a number of events already this year. There was a big conference in the fall uh, called Year Zero. Um, and the follow-up conference will be taking place uh, at the Frankie Institute um, uh, on um, Thursday and Friday, April 26th and 7th. Um, and it's called uh, After 1948, Realignments in Politics and Culture. Um, lots of very distinguished speakers from all around the country and indeed the world. And if it's anything like as good as the one we did to open the year in October, it will be very good indeed. Uh, one of the stalwarts of the 1848, uh, 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 1948 project is, in fact, our speaker today. But another is his introducer, uh, who's been uh, fabulous uh, in helping us out with a number of events. That's John Kelly, who is professor of anthropology and in the college. He's also a director of the Human Rights Program at the University of Chicago, uh, director of the South Asian Language and Area Center, and co-director of our Big Problems uh, undergraduate uh, curriculum that is also housed in the Frankie. He's a man who um, uh, has uh, uh, unfortunately um, revealed his talents, and we all make use of them at every opportunity. Uh, more's, the, more's the pity for him, but uh, more's the gain for us. So John, will you come to the honors? It's a real pleasure for me to be here tonight to, to introduce James Sparrow. Uh, I want to very quickly go over some of the, the details of uh, James's career so you can be oriented and then delve something into the argument of the book that we're here tonight to hear about and in a certain sense to celebrate. It merits it. Um, Jim was an undergraduate at uh, University of Pennsylvania studying American history and then went and got his PhD at Brown University. And we pretty much immediately snapped him up and made him an assistant professor of history here, where he's been ever since, recently tenured. The book that we're going to be hearing from and about tonight, Warfare State, World War II Americans and the Age of Big Government, recently uh, was an honorable mention for the 2012 Frederick Jackson Turner Award uh, of the uh, Association of American History. That's a very, very big deal. Uh, and I, what I want to do now is, is help you understand the book and its context and then thereby introduce Jim. American history is a different discipline than the rest. Uh, there is something very, very interesting about being an American historian, and that's the theme I want to develop as I, as I introduce Jim. This book is part of a trilogy. Uh, the Warfare State is going to be followed by a book that I think is now mostly complete but not yet published called New Leviathan, Sovereign America, and the Foundations of Rule in the Atomic Age. That one, in turn, will be followed by a book called The Problem of Legitimacy in the American Century, which is basically a series of ideas Jim and I were discussing in the car, right, on the way over, uh, which is going to be dealing with legitimation crises. And that book is going to start getting closer and closer to the present as Jim finishes this trilogy. And that's the theme I want to raise as we get ready to listen to Jim. And I want you to give Jim some trouble tonight, frankly. Uh, 
That's what you're allowed to do when you're dealing with an American historian. That's my point. Uh, not only is everyone in the room experienced in American history at one degree or another, most are American citizens, and many are actually around during some of the events that Jim is talking about. And that means that Jim's got an epistemic problem compared to people in other disciplines like my own. If I tell you about the Fiji Islands or if I tell you about, uh, about uh, Highland Asia, about not Manipur or Nagaland, I mean, what can you do but be polite and wait for the dinner or whatever? Uh, but uh, Jim is telling you things about America and about Americans. Now, this is a very special kind of academic calling because it takes a certain bravery and a certain insight at the same time coming from within the society you operate in. And I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I was around in this part of the, 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 uh, the faculty and administrative campaign to hire Jim and persuade him that the University of Chicago was the place he should be. I think the intellectual growth he's showing in the, this project as it unfolds is evidence that he made a good choice and that this is the right place for him to develop these insights. But the core thing I want to do is not brag about what the U of C is doing for Jim, but to explain something about Jim and his prominence at the U of Chicago, which is this. It's extremely rare in the very dense field of American history to find a new American historian whose work is both uh, significant, probably even correct, uh, and novel. This is a very, very thick field. Many, many people have said many, many things over the years about American history. You're going to discover tonight that, that James Sparrow has something to say that you probably, I submit, and this is the first test, have never thought about in these terms or seen in this way. And that leads to the question, he's persuaded me, but will he persuade you? Uh, that's why I'm saying begin to give him trouble. About what? I want you to, to focus now on what the real thesis is in Warfare State. And I want to read you two excerpts from it and then give, give up the stage uh, at long last. Uh, very early in the book, Jim is setting up his topic, and he's talking about Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the fireside chats. And he says the following. With each fireside chat, it seemed, the president made a point of reinforcing the direct moral obligation that bound ordinary citizens to the heroic soldiers who gave their lives for their country. It began as early as his Four Freedoms Address before the war in January 1941, a speech remembered less for its invocation of obligation than for its pledge to secure freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. In a landmark statement which would shape wartime's rights rhetoric, Roosevelt also asserted that the interests of individuals and groups must give way to the national need, as must anything else that stood in the way of speed and efficiency in defense preparations. It was the sovereign people who held the highest claim Quote, a free nation has the right to expect full cooperation from all groups, end quote. Not the famous part of that speech, but to Jim's point, the important part by Jim's interpretation. That sovereignty was embodied by the federal government empowered to place the collective good above all else. From the very beginning, then, the liberal ideas of freedom and rights championed by Roosevelt and his war administrators were predicated on the greater uh, on the greater obligation to meet the requirements of national belonging. Uh, there's more to it, but I'm going to skip ahead to one more passage to, again, underline what kind of historian Jim is, how he puts his argument together, and what the content of this argument is. This is not a candidate for, to be a bestseller, despite the lucidity with which it's written. The first chapter is titled, War Displaces Its Analog. Now, what that means is something of a puzzle. War displaces, I, t I didn't really know until I asked Jim and I found out that there's a Luchtenberg article about uh, the New Deal and the analog of war, but I kind of figured it out by the time I got to the end of the chapter. The analog of war is the rhetoric of being like a war of the New Deal. James Sparrow is, is contrasting his own research with a strong thesis that it was the New Deal that really knit America together, that we've already in our discussion before the talk, we were talking about the 50 states plural versus the idea of a union of the states. Now, is it the Civil War that brings that union together? Is it, as many historians before Jim have argued, is it the New Deal that really created the national citizen? That's what Sparrow was taught, and it's what he used to think until he did his archival work. But as you'll discover tonight, Sparrow doesn't believe that anymore. Sparrow really believes that something fundamental happened in the United States during World War II, that something changed positively in the subjectivity of the citizenry with foreseen and unforeseen effects for all of us and really made the United States in a fundamentally new way. 
um, he's writing about now about uh, some of these values. It was precisely self-interest that animated ordinary citizens' engagement with the political culture of the home front and elevated their expectations of government. He doesn't want you to believe that a kind of moral duty to the nation is ever superseding a sense of entitled self-interest among Americans. The question is, when did a sensibility rise that brought them together? Half a year after Roosevelt's 1941 inaugural address, the All Youth Club of Waterbury, Connecticut, sent an outraged telegram to General Lewis B. Hershey, head of the Selective Service System. The ordered cancellation of striking defense workers' deferments is to be condemned as an arbitrary, undemocratic attack, inconsistent with President Roosevelt's self-declared four freedoms. So this bizarre petition uh, is of interest to Professor Sparrow in how it illustrates now the embodiment of a critique of the use of government power in the very terms that articulated these new power. Um, uh, and a later petition was sent to Chester Bowles, head of the Office of Price Administration. It protested injustices perpetrated by a local, a local rationing board in Willoughby, Ohio. Just what do the four freedoms mean, it began. My board thinks that a man should crawl on his hands and knees in order to get what other people get, and the petition goes on. And again, Professor Sparrow is asking us to think about what does it mean to hear the four freedoms now the foundation of claims of right upon the government. Now, to show you his style as an historian on this second petition, he puts it in definite context. Four years later, and an entire war later than that first petition, this second one is sent. On the day that the second atomic bomb was dropped over Nagasaki, that's the day this letter was arrived. So the stakes here are, what do those war powers have to do with this new sensibility? And how does this new sensibility really operate? So uh, to read to you for a final time uh, uh, what Professor Sparrow was saying, ordinary Americans may not have swallowed the New Deal line whole. In other words, the Roosevelt administration is trying to sell an idea of national citizenship and national duty from the beginning of the New Deal. Uh, they may not have swallowed the New Deal whole, but most of them did identify powerfully and intimately with Roosevelt, especially after Pearl Harbor. As part of that process of identification, they began to adapt the rhetoric of rights and freedom to their own lives. Most important, they did not challenge the war, but accepted it as an uncontroversial matter of national interest. In this regard, the construct of a unitary national interest proved the administration's most enduring ideological accomplishment. Far more significant than any of the putatively liberal ideological imaginings the administration sought to encode into its warring. This is a very strong thesis about how the United States comes together and when. And I'm going to let James Sparrow explain it better and defend it. Well, uh, thank you, John, for setting me up on the rotisserie. Uh, <laughs> I knew that uh, coming to this audience, <laughs> I'd be on the firing line, but you've just added some ammunition. Um, well, I, I do want to thank uh, John for that uh, wonderful and penetrating introduction. It's always a, a pleasure to, to speak with John. I learned more about my own project than I knew going into it, um, and, and that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. And I also would like to uh, thank Jim and the Franke Institute for providing this venue. This is a wonderful opportunity to engage um, the Chicago audience, but in a different setting where one is forced to flex different kinds of muscles. So let me begin. Although my talk today is about World War II America, I want to begin with a story that the Democratic Senator Fritz Hollings of South Carolina famously liked to tell back in the Reagan 80s. It goes like this. A veteran went to college on the GI Bill bought his house with an FHA loan, saw his kids born in a VA hospital, started a business with an SBA loan, got electricity from the TVA, and later, water from an EPA project. His parents on Social Security retired to a farm, got electricity from the REA, and had their soil tested by the USDA. When his father became ill, the family was saved from financial ruin by Medicare, and a life was saved with a drug developed by the NIH. His kids participated in the school lunch program, learned physics from teachers trained at an NSF program, and went to college with guaranteed student loans. He drove to work on the interstate and moored his boat in a channel dredged by Army engineers. When the floods hit, 
he took Amtrak to Washington to apply for disaster relief and spent some time in the Smithsonian mu Museums. Then one day he got mad. He wrote his congressman an angry letter. Get the government off my back, he wrote. I'm tired of paying for all those programs created by ungrateful people. Now, this kind of thinking has become prominent, perhaps even defining um, in today's politics. The laundry list of programs in Hollings' compressed allegory is really a list of collective obligations. In other countries, these obligations would be understood as obligations owed to the nation. But in the United States, we see only entitlements, which become a kind of property, personal property in the American mind, claimed through the language of rights. Commentators like to trace this confusion to recent developments in national politics, but Hollings was telling his story back in the 80s, in the early 80s. I would like to argue that the origins of the confusion lie much farther back, and a paradox planted decades ago at the center of the social contract that legitimized the most centralized and powerful government the United States has ever seen during World War II. The Americans who lived through the Second World War partook of a sweeping transformation in the foundations of national government. Internationally, American power leapt far beyond territorial bounds, inaugurating an era of globalism. Domestically, warfare replaced welfare as the central purpose of the national state. More than in any period since the Civil War, changes in government politicized everyday life, touching nearly every American. For soldiers and civilians alike, the war instilled a sense of entitlement to full citizenship that the federal government would increasingly have to placate, if not always fulfill, in subsequent years. At the same time, and for related reasons, the integrity of the state, and especially the loyalty of its employees and citizens, became paramount concerns. These were twinned. Total war changed the stakes of national government, even in the United States, where it brought full employment and economic mobilization, rather than shelled out cities and masses of refugees. Within the span of half a decade, the United States departed from some of its longest and most dearly held political tradition. It inaugurated the peacetime draft and deployed a large and permanent standing army nationwide, uh, worldwide. It became uh, entangled in precisely the kinds of alliances that Washington had warned against in the early years of the Republic. It even launched the mass income tax and became reliant on structural deficits, despite the aversion to taxing and spending that also goes back to the founding. The departure from precedent was striking even when set against the recent expansion of the welfare state under the New Deal. The agencies that conducted the mobilization for the Second World War quickly dwarfed programs that had seemed gargantuan only a few years earlier. And we can get a sense of this. I could go on and on with these slides because I'm, my department's in the social sciences division, so we like numbers as well as uh, uh, letters. Um, but here you see military personnel as a proportion of the population um, and the effect on the government as a whole and government and society can be captured by civilian non-postal employment, which also goes up quite radically. And this is a presence felt throughout society. You compare 1939 to the low point in 1949 and you see that even at its lowest point, the post-war state was far larger, far more uh, present than um, the New Deal had been at its peak. And not only did the federal government expand in sheer size and presence during the war, but just as importantly, it dramatically extended the scope and the nature and the quality of its authority. This is when the imperial presidency was born. The state of emergency that was declared by the Second War Powers Act of 1942 did not officially end until 1952, by which time other emergencies had uh, made it moot. Given the traditions of individualism and decentralized governance that had long conspired to thwart a centralized national state in the United States, the triumphal and unimpeded ascent of big government in the 1940s requires explanation. How was it that this massive new warfare state with its global mission attracted so little of the dissent and opposition that had marked other conflicts from the Civil War 
the First World War and on up into Vietnam and beyond. In the 1940s, there was no tax uh, revolt. There were no draft riots. There was no post-war isolationism comparable to what we had seen in the interwar period. The compliance, even the quiescence that attended the dramatic policy departures of these years requires explanation. The answers that millions of Americans gave to the question of why we fight mattered deeply. They were a hard constraint on the state. They mattered for the patriotism and the national citizenship that the war effort cultivated in Americans and, just as importantly, it mattered for the emerging structures of a national state that could not win the war without their compliance. The activist state changed profoundly when its goals and modes of political mobilization shifted from welfare to warfare. It took the Roosevelt administration some time to realize this. Much as one might retrofit an automobile factory to produce bombers, Roosevelt and his speechwriters retooled their ideological framework in the late 1930s and early 1940s, portraying the coming confrontation with fascism as an international extension of New Deal reform, a kind of New Deal for the world, as Elizabeth Borgwart has argued. The Atlantic Charter and the other visionary statements of New Deal internationalism reflected this sensibility. But the foundations for the government's legitimacy shifted as well, as New Dealers adapted the imagery and the meanings of activist government to suit the requirements of a national interest now defined by military security rather than by economic security, stability, and social justice. To promote national unity and full mobilization, government propagandists placed an emphasis on personal sacrifice, a strategy that emerged from an early insight into the psychology of civilian morale. Government propagandists learned from confidential survey research, which was quite systematic and uh, exhaustive, uh, that simply imploring civilians to do their part and to sacrifice was not sufficient to motivate them to comply with the many requirements of the war mobilization. The most effective appeals were those that personalized government messages, um, while at the same time downplaying ideological statements that were nonetheless folded into those messages. Taken together, such messages amounted to what the art historian George Roeder has termed the home front analogy. Here we have a prime example of that where saving uh, fats from cooking is equated with uh, the uh, production of armaments because of the way in which glycerins could be recovered and used to produce bombs. What was going on here was a pointed evaluation of every conceivable aspect of civilian life according to its contribution to the war effort, most often by tracing the consequences of battlefront, um, uh, sorry, tracing the battlefront consequences of ordinary decisions at home following the appeal of the folk wisdom for the want of a nail, the war was lost. In this rhetorical universe, defense workers were promoted to soldiers of production. Home gardens became victory gardens. Young women willing to socialize with soldiers were called victory girls. And there was a constant equation of these small acts as somehow contributing directly to the material available to the soldier. Here you see um, war stamps, war saving stamps, feeding into the magazine for a machine gun, but these metaphors were ubiquitous. Even the most private and most mundane aspects of life were made relevant to the war effort, usually by contrasting civilian concerns with the drastic sacrifices of idealized combat soldiers. You can just imagine coming out of a factory and seeing this poster, what did you do today for freedom? And at the end, the line, every civilian a fighter It was this idealized symbol of nationalistic self-sacrifice, the combat soldier, that provided the master key to wartime political culture. The GI was a culture hero whose name stood for government issue in a joking reference to the standardized nature of the military in which he served. He personified the new ideals of a changing order. His order and ordinariness and his common touch conveyed the democratic and humane nature of American war as opposed to the regimentation and the hierarchy of the Wehrmacht or the fanaticism of Japanese dive bombers. At the same time, he represented martial virtues that supplanted the more social democratic conception of the Depression era man on the street 
The GI's appeal was also quite personal. He provided individuals with a model onto whom they could project an intimate identification, as if he were a brother, father, son, or husband. He was a rugged individual. He did his part and didn't get too sentimental about it. He was an ordinary Joe, but most of all, the GI was a hero who dominated the society and the culture of the American home front, and he was vested with a moral authority that did not uh, fade after the war has ended. And here you can see uh, the five Sullivan brothers who all died in the Solomons, um, later memorialized in Saving uh, Private Ryan, um, the idea that they did their part and what sacrifice could civilians do that would compare to the sacrifice that they had made. Well, in this analogizing that suffused home front society, the government subtly and quite unintentionally politicized everyday life by drawing connections between the battlefront and the home front so insistently. Propaganda encouraged citizens to think expansively about the moral significance of their own part in the war effort. As the war propelled millions of migrants and GIs beyond the confines of their local circumstances, the island communities in which they lived, to pursue broader horizons, it also placed them in new contact with the federal government, whose ideological guarantees suddenly had concrete ramifications in everyday lives. People began to expect a new degree of fairness, and they came to expect the federal government to guarantee that fairness. My book looks at three realms in which mass mobilization for total war politicized everyday life, and that's what the rest of the talk will look at, uh, fiscal citizenship, industrial war work, and military service. Fiscal citizenship may sound exquisitely boring, but in fact, it was, although I guess these days it's not, but uh, it was absolutely central to the American war mobilization, which relied on an overwhelming superiority of industrial production funded by the public purse to counterbalance the fascist military initiative. By 1942-1943, the United States was uh, producing five times as much war material as Japan, twice as much as Germany. So it was necessary to bolster the public household, the ability to uh, accomplish fiscal extraction. The Second World War was 10 times more expensive than its predecessor. And we can see here how that expense became a per permanent structural uh, component of, uh, of American society simply by looking at personal income taxes as um, a proportion of the GNP and of um, personal income. And you see how, uh, how much more radically extracted this fiscal regime was than the New Deal regime had been. It was also uh, much more uh, redistributive, um, even though in some ways it was not as progressive uh, as was initially envisioned by the New Dealers in the 1930s. Without tax payments and bond purchases by millions of Americans, virtually all Americans owned war bonds. Uh, they stopped counting when they got to 85 million out of 130. Um, without this, and without the subsequent votes by Americans to elect Congresses that would sustain the new uh, fiscal system rather than dismantle or undermine it, the post-war state would have stood on feet of clay, ready to crumble at the slightest challenge. Growth politics, the affluent society, and the global ambitions of growth politics bankrolled depended on the economic and the political compliance of ordinary Americans. Now, contrary to common wisdom, mass participation in the new fiscal regime was far from automatic. Enforcement and patriotic peer pressure, although necessary, were nonetheless insufficient to goad a populace that was not yet habituated to participating in public finance. You see here how few people paid income taxes until the Second World War when mass income taxation began. It's quite striking. The dark line at the top is income taxpayers as a proportion of the labor force. The lower line is of the general population. Almost nobody paid income tax except for the very wealthy until the, the Second World War began. This is a problem of education, of teaching people how to file their taxes, not just of dealing with tax evaders, of whom there were surprisingly few. To accomplish mass participation in war finance, the Treasury had to overcome a formidable cultural challenge. It had to persuade the majority of Americans that paying federal income taxes and buying war bonds were the legitimate duties of citizens. And it had to do so only a few years after FDR's Depression era Soak the Rich tax scheme had placed the symbolic, although not actual, burden of fiscal citizenship on the classes rather than the masses. 
to get a sense of how the Treasury accomplished this formidable task. Consider the pitch-perfect approach of the radio star and maternal patriotic icon, Kate Smith. She artfully combined all the techniques invoking personal obligation to the soldier when she conducted a radio marathon in September of 1943 that raised a record-breaking $39 million in war bond pledges over the course of just 18 hours. This is um, memorialized in Robert Merton's landmark study, Mass Persuasion. Smith wasted no time during the drive to turn to a gripping tale of devotion to the combat soldier. Not 10 minutes into her broadcast, she recounted the words of a man whose speech at a recent bond rally cast the home front analogy in a bitter light. And here I'll quote at length. You know, friends, when we buy war bonds, this is the, the man at the rally. When we buy war bonds, we're not buying tanks and guns and shells and planes, which is a common feature of the war bond propaganda. What we're really doing is buying our boys back, bringing them home to us, safe and sound once again. Now I know there isn't a person listening to me who wouldn't give everything he has to buy his boy back. I'd give anything, all my money, or my health, or my own life, to buy my boy back from the war, but I'm afraid I can't do that now. You see, I got a telegram from Washington this morning, my boy isn't coming back. Smith concluded the segment by asking her audience, when you think of these wounded and suffering boys who are paying so great a price, can you honestly think that any sacrifice you have made is enough? This approach, as a large body of Treasury funded research amply demonstrated, worked. Weighing their own sacrifices against those of the idealized combat soldiers, Americans would consent to buy their boys back in record numbers during World War II, and I'd be happy to go into detail about that, but it's a, quite a remarkable story. Um, it worked, but it worked within certain parameters. Some of the messages that worked most effectively were aimed at school children. These messages were especially effective in habituating young Americans to fiscal citizenship while working liberal ideology into the curriculum. War bond savings clubs taught math skills and civic lessons while allowing students to provision GI Joe one stamp at a time. Entire schools bought Jeeps and aircraft carriers emblazoned with plaques identifying their bond with a combat soldier. Uh, many schools would feature a poster like this showing students how they could save up for different parts of a Jeep. The Jeeps would have plaques telling soldiers who had bought that Jeep for them. Uh, entire factories launched aircraft carriers, conducted massive bond drives in industrial cities, um, and, uh, and identified with the material they were producing. Uh, if you can't read the sign, it says, um, here we go to Tokyo, Newport News, shipyard workers, war bonds, help to sink the rising sun. This is at the launching of the USS Boxer in December of 1944. The most effective promotions allowed Americans to feel and to touch their soldiers and the war that they are in. Here's Your Infantry was a promotion in which um, units of men were brought back from the uh, advanced theaters of battle and reenacted battles with, with real uh, war material for local communities, um, uh, flushing out um, uh, machine guns, for example, and pillboxes that were erected in town squares. Well, on the whole, the Treasury and other parts of the government succeeded in educating American consumers to their obligations as fiscal citizens. To a surprising degree, Americans accepted their new taxes as legitimate, if unpleasant. An astonishing 85 to 90 percent of respondents consistently indicated that they felt their taxes were fair in the last years of the war, when patience for exhortations to sacrifice grew thin. And I might add that Americans continue to identify their federal income taxes as the fairest taxes that they paid well into the early 1970s, which might surprise some of you, but up to that point. That was the perception of the federal income tax. Well, the resulting sensibility of mass income tax payment and fiscal citizenship, that's my tax dollar, has resonated throughout the national political culture ever since. Indeed, the sense of entitlement captured by that phrase began to reveal itself even during the war, when the sacrifice of tax paying and bond holding were portrayed as down payments on a higher standard of living in the post-war period, 
This expectation of a standard of living put limits on what people would pay above 10 percent of their income and would re wreak havoc with the anti-inflation program. Um, but that's within the larger context of enthusiastic mobilization within those boundaries. A similar, if more contentious dynamic of obligation and entitlement took place among industrial workers and the war factors that produced America's overwhelming material superiority in the global conflict. War workers took very seriously their image as soldiers of production in an arsenal of democracy. Like taxpayers and bondholders, they conceptualized their moral link, link to the fighting front by objectifying it in the war material that they sent directly to the GIs from the shop floor. This is a typical poster that might be found on the wall of a factory uh, urging workers on to ever greater production. And here, if you look closely, you'll see that on the left, um, there's a war worker on a shop floor. And he's handing a shell to a, a sailor on the deck of a ship who's fighting the enemy directly on the front. And the arrow says, you're the man behind the man behind the gun. Meanwhile, there's a cumulo nimbus, nimbus version of the nation in the form of Uncle Sam looking on with approval. This powerful sense among workers that they were fighting alongside the combat soldier not only linked the home front to the battle front, but it also fostered a rising sense of entitlement to national citizenship. For women and for black workers, this revealed itself in a rising determination to press the government to guarantee fairness, to guarantee its uh, promises of fair employment. Although they did not realize those goals during the war, both groups were permanently politicized by the experience and thereby launched a generation of early civil rights unionism and also of labor feminism, which is less known uh, popularly but was quite striking in this period as well. White ethnic workers enjoyed more immediate gains as labor boards recognized leaders as junior partners in councils of war. The institutionalization of labor arbitration during the war made union rights of membership, seniority, hiring, firing, and work conditions something the federal government had to manage now on a regular basis and not simply adjudicate um, during a representation election. The ability of working class Americans to join the affluent society of the 1940s and rise within it for the next two decades was a product of this labor rights social contract produced by the war mobilization and by this identification. Yet the claims to fuller social citizenship came at a great cost. Arbitration and nationalism undercut union militancy. The strike wave of 1945 to 1946 turned out to be labor's last hurrah rather than the social democratic revolution that figures like Walter Ruther hoped it would be. Some of this was due to dynamics internal to the labor movement as it devolved into bread and butter unionism, becoming more and more focused on benefits rather than industrial democracy, as it was called. But of equal importance was the role of Americanism uh, in curbing and policing the, the kinds of claims that workers could make. This was the double-edged nature of the bargain with the warfare state, mounting demands that soldiers of production be forced to work or fight crested right along with the unauthorized wildcat strikes that many workers indulged as a symbolic protest of the wage caps and managerial controls that war agencies imposed. As the wildcats continued, even Roosevelt became convinced that a national, ser uh, national service law was necessary. Indeed, he in introduced a full-blown proposal for national service as the price Americans should pay for his economic bill of rights. And that's uh, what John was uh, referring to in his introduction, the, 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 uh, the obligation that came along with those rights. By the time of Roosevelt's last fireside chat in January of 1945, he had shifted from his Depression-era emphasis on the derelictions of the wealthy to excoriate workers who, quote, lay down on their essential jobs, that they exacted a price whose payment would have to be made, quote, in the life's blood of our own sons. Once again, Roosevelt urged the Congress to adopt national service legislation to provide our fighting men with, quote, supreme proof that civilians were giving them what they are entitled to, which is nothing less than our total effort back home. Almost as an afterthought, Roosevelt reiterated his earlier commitment to the Economic Bill of Rights, but the focus was squarely on the soldier. This was Roosevelt at his crankiest. He was dying slowly, 
and he had grown impatient even with the stalwarts among his electoral base. But it revealed how the nationalistic logic of Americanism and entitlement could serve either master, Americanism or entitlement. Depending on who held the reins in national politics, and what needs the managers of the warfare state deemed most urgent. In the immediate post-war years, Soviet ambitions in Eastern Europe and elsewhere altered understandings of the national interest, while labor scarcity, which had dominated the social democratic politics of the war, evaporated with the return of nine million soldiers within a year of VJ Day. In this context, the enemies of labor would take its demonization to extremes, portraying the social democratic energies un unleashed by the war and the assertiveness those energies inspired in industrial workers as an un-American subversion mounted by communists and fellow travelers. So this un-Americanism is part and parcel with a sense of entitlement uh, and polices it. The Tar Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 would ultimately institutionalize these restraints on social dem democracy. But what's often not noted is that Taft-Hartley also institutionalized arbitration, making labor rights permanent in a way that the Wagner Act did not, um, even if these rights were no longer transformative, in part because high and uninterrupted levels of production remained essential to Cold War strategy. Well, the most dramatic illustration of the tensions and the trade-offs that attended the war of time fusion of Americanism and entitlement is provided by the citizen soldiers who did the fighting. GIs were walking, talking proof that the last thing you want to be in a time of war is a living symbol of national sacrifice. In the end, it was their sacrifice that determined the legitimacy of the war government, and it did so in fateful ways. The mass experience of military service during World War II fostered two irreconcilable impulses among GIs. On the one hand, Near universal military service inculcated a deep sense of national commitment that remains a defining aspect of the war generation's outlook. Although no more than one out of every 10 would see a shot fired in anger, all 16 million men who served in the armed forces had placed their lives at the disposal of their country. And each was held to the masculine standard of the idealized combat soldier. Despite the fact that the GIs carried the heaviest burdens of the war squarely on their weary shoulders, most sustained powerful attachments to the country that they served, particularly that part of it that they called home. As one former factory worker, Edmund Borsiewicz, wrote back to his buddies at the National Brooch Shop in Detroit in December of 1945, quote, it's good to know that the plant I worked for once is turning out equipment of the best quality so fellows overseas will have the best to carry on with. So here you see that moral bond being reciprocated uh, by Borsiewicz. It wasn't always reciprocated, but the, the connection to the home front in one form or another, whether it was uh, connected to, to working class communities in Detroit or farm communities in the Midwest um, or other communities around the nation, that connection was exceptionally powerful. And it was that connection that made mail call the most important time of day for American soldiers out, uh, out in the field. This is a photograph of, um, of a bombing squad squadron stationed in the South Pacific and the Solomon Islands receiving mail in February of 1944. And you can just see from the posture and the uh, stances of these men uh, how intent and how focused, how somber that moment was for them. It reflected that deep connection to the home front. On the other hand, the GIs also felt resentment at civilians' relative freedom. Much like taxpayers, bondholders, and industrial workers, servicemen selectively appropriated some themes of wartime political culture to make sense of their experience. And as with their civilian counterparts, uh, as was the case with their civilian counterparts, these appropriations and the actions they authorized among the GIs followed this logic of Americanism and entitlement that I've been talking about. Since we already know a great deal about the heroism of the GIs from the many books and films that have celebrated the Allied triumph during World War II, I'm going to focus here on exploring the less familiar and less celebrated but still very important truths that revealed themselves when morale broke down and servicemen marked out what they considered to be the outer boundaries of their sacrifice, the limits of the wartime social contract. Despite their many divisions 
according to rank, race, branch, theater. American servicemen shared a set of experiential coordinates that oriented them toward each other, toward the military, and toward the nation. Almost to a man, they resented the rear echelon of other soldiers and civilians who were more removed than they were from the fighting. This was true at the same time that servicemen clung to the memories of home and relished any contact with family or friends while on leave or through the mail. The ambivalent mixture of, on the one hand, longing and affection for a lost civilian identity, and on the other hand, resentment of bearing most of the burden of wartime sacrifice, had powerful effects on servicemen's identities. Consequently, they regarded their military service as a crucible of both their manhood and their national citizenship, which together established their, their Americanism. What GIs could not abide was any indication that their sacrifices were being undermined, mocked, or capitalized upon by civilians or stateside soldiers. The moral map of wartime society implied by the notion of a rear echelon, uh, which extensive research revealed was a preoccupation among the soldiers, it revealed what the hero worship of the combat soldier looked like from the inside when you're in the boots of the combat soldier as an ideal. It wasn't always pretty. GIs agreed with civilians that proximity to the hell of combat determined worthiness, but that also meant that those who were farther from combat um, and were also making claims on sacrifice and on citizenship um, were less worthy. And so this explosion of entitlement that the war unleashed also placed different groups within society on a collision course. Perhaps the starkest demonstration of the GI's resentment of the rear echelon took place on the streets of Los Angeles in early June of 1943, when sailors, soldiers, and Marines banded together in the Zoot Suit riots. Acting on a mounting sense of outrage spurred by previous street battles with Mexican Americans known as Pachucos, the servicemen set things straight. During the violent outbreak, which set off a summer of rioting and racial tension nationwide, servicemen banded together in impromptu gangs and taxicab brigades and hunted down dwellers of what they perceived to be a criminal underworld. And when they caught them, they stripped them of their zoot suits. What's really curious about this, and I'd be happy to talk about it, I can't go into it at great length here, is how much of the violence in the zoot suit riots was heavily symbolic. In Detroit, um, many people lay dead at the end of the riots. Nobody died in the zoot suit riots. Um, and while, as you can see here, um, uh, many young Mexican-American men were beaten up, they were beaten up in the process of a symbolic annihilation, symbolic destruction of their zoot suits. And the focus on the zoot suit in particular tearing the suit apart, burning it, dancing around the suit. It's really quite striking and makes this different from the other wartime um, race riots. To the rioting white servicemen, the zoot suitors were sinister figures who wore the emblems of their subversive intent on their backs. And you can see from these mug shots how the zoot suit was criminalized, was come to see, be seen as um, uh, a suit of, of uh, subversion and criminality, of un-Americanism in the eyes of, of some. They wore flamboyant zoot suits whose excessive use of cloth qualified them as black market items according to the War Production Board regulation. So this is a badge of refusal to sacrifice as well as an advertisement for one's um, refusal to serve in the military in its most extreme form. At least it was an advertisement of leisure. But this was only for the hardcore few who were devoted to the zoot suit lifestyle. There's a much broader group um, of youths who wore the zoot suit, um, much as um, popular clothing is worn today, who affected certain aspects of the style. And they were treated by the soldiers as if they were zoot suitors. Um, but in fact, some of them were in the military, some of them were serving, and, and most of them saw themselves as patriotic American. As American. Nonetheless, in the eyes of most soldiers and white civilians, the Zooters' suits and the lifestyle that they advertised were a defiant rejection of the moral economy of the home front, a perversely inverted uniform that mocked the soldier's sacrifice. Their very presence in public places seemed to flaunt an unpatriotic self-indulgence. Though I should add, that's not how the Pachucos saw it. These are um, some high school students. You can see a Zoot Suiter off the right there. Um, and as I mentioned, this is really just part of a larger youth subculture um, 
So through ritualized and pointedly symbolic violence, the soldiers during the riots reasserted the moral authority of the, uh, of, of the combat soldier as a culture hero, and they did so before cheering crowds of white civilians who egged them on. Interestingly, Mexican Americans and their advocates like Carrie McWilliams responded not by denouncing militarism, but by embracing the ideal of the combat soldier and by emphasizing their own patriotism and military service. Which the, riot, which the rioting white servicemen had threatened to undermine. As one zoot suitor put it, quote, pretty soon I guess I'll be in the army and I'll be glad to go, but I want to be treated like everyone else. We're tired of being told we can't go to this show or that dance hall because we're Mexican, or that we better not be seen on the beachfront, or that we can't wear draped pants or have our, cut, our hair cut the way we want to, as in the Argentine duck, ducktail that uh, zooters affected. This sense of entitlement did not pass muster in 1943. The American standard of living was still in the process of becoming an entitlement to which American citizens might lay claim. So it proved too provocative when sported by assertive Pachuco. The military uniform had been too thoroughly glorified to brook any challenge. Who then had more moral authority to put the Zooters in their place than the servicemen whose sacrifice was the polar star for an entire home front culture? A final window onto the tension between Americanism and entitlement that shaped the GI's emerging sense of national citizenship appeared during the so-called army mutiny that broke out between December of 1945 and February of 1946. Due to breakneck demobilization and a refusal at home to raise draft quotas, both of which were political compromises accepted by the Truman administration in response to powerful political pressures after VJ Day, the army revealed that winter that it would have to depart from the point system that had promised GIs an orderly way to anticipate their release from military service after an average of more than three years of serving during the duration. Gradually, it became clear that over a million men who qualified for release um, would have to remain at their stations until shipping conditions and military recruitment improved. This about face proved explosive because of the nature of the point system. It was based on an, extensive, uh, on an extensive army research into the criteria that the GIs themselves felt would make for the fairest demobilization policy. What the point system did was it awarded priority for combat, first and foremost, length of service, particularly overseas, and family dependence. So what you had in the point system was a precise arithmetical calculation of a man's moral worth within the wartime political culture. By abandoning the point system, the army, had abrogated the fictive social contract under which mass conscription was deemed legitimate. And in the response, the soldiers turned the tables on their superiors to demonstrate their, ple their displeasure and their lack of consent, and to demonstrate how absolutely vital legitimacy was to a functioning warfare state. The response among the troops was immediate and spontaneous, although it became more organized and politically potent over the weeks that followed. On Christmas Day, 1945, a rowdy group of 4,000 soldiers stationed in Manila marched on the replacement depot headquarters there. They were sent back to their barracks by Colonel J.C. Campbell, who barked, you men forget you're not working for General Motors, where the UAW had just shut down operations with a massive strike. On January 6, an even larger mob of 20,000 soldiers, and that's an estimate, converged on the command headquarters in City Hall to confront the local commander, Lieutenant General William Steyer. The protests soon spread from the Pacific, where they were most intense, to other theaters, soon reaching London and Paris. The unrest spread even to the occupation troops, who, according to Time magazine, should have known better. When Secretary of War Robert Patterson visited Yokohama on an inspection tour of the Pacific, he was greeted with booze. In Frankfurt, Germany, 2,000 men entered the Army headquarters and harangued their commanding officer, Lieutenant General Joseph T. McNarney, goading him to come out and meet his troops. When they were informed that he was attending a meeting of the four powers in Berlin, they booed and they hissed, mocking him. Predictably, if you know anything about the army, army officials charged treachery and subversion. Major General Clovis Byers, chief of staff for the 8th Army in Japan, claimed, quote, it appears that subversive forces are deliberately at work for obscure reasons, attempting to undermine the morale of our army. Byers was not alone in his conviction. The newly resurrected House Committee on Un-American Activities began an investigation of communist subversion among protesting GIs and left-leaning veterans organizations. 
Committee counsel Ernie Adamson claimed, quote, communistic agitators actually went into the army for the sole purpose of causing trouble. The Catholic journal Commonweal noted that communist party organs and fellow traveling sheets had provided, quote, an abundance of slogans for orientating the protest. In the end, of course, none of these mutineers were court-martialed. There was no conspiracy. Even as, at the same time, accusations of treason and sabotage were hurled at striking workers who participated in the great strike wave of 1945 to 1946. The image of the combat soldier was too sacred to warrant consistent treatment. There was, however, an exquisite irony to this state of affairs. The soldiers who were uh, mutinying considered themselves to be second-class citizens. As Stars and Stripes put it, the, one of the um, soldiers' uh, papers, and the soldiers risked being court-martialed for mutiny in order to challenge that status of second-class citizen and return themselves to a civilian life devoid of what the soldiers called the aristocracy-peasantry relationship imposed by the top brass. Yet the society to which they returned guaranteed them, or at least the 14 million of them who would become white male veterans, a first-class citizenship whose scope and comprehensiveness was unparalleled in the history of the United uh, American welfare state. This is the GI Bill of Rights. The imagined moral bonds connecting civilians' hero worship of the combat soldier to the GI's own assertion of entitlement to full citizenship due to sacrifice for the nation formed a perfect closed circuit. It was this closed circuit of Americanism and entitlement that would define expansive notions of national citizenship while policing and politically sustaining the ever-growing national security state for the next three decades. Thank you.